Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you work in a large system that's hard to change and easy to introduce bugs, you've likely just wanted to rewrite the entire thing from scratch. The reality of it is, that's not likely to happen. However, here's how you can decompose that spaghetti code mess into something more manageable. I want to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. I have no idea where the term spaghetti code came to describe a system that's really hard to change, that's kind of a mess, that's people what people really refer to, probably because you think about a lot of things being intertwined. If you were to take your code base likely, it looks very similar to this probably, where you could think of each one of these little boxes as a class, as a module, et cetera, where really what you're describing is there's a lot of coupling. There's a lot of coupling between different parts of your system, and that's what makes it really hard to change. So if you're changing one part of your system, it can affect so many because so many other parts depend on it. As with many things in software architecture and design, you're managing coupling, you're fighting coupling. And that is oftentimes the root cause of a lot of reasons why Oh, I'm changing this, I introduced a bug here, or I'm changing this, or it's really difficult to change this because there's so much coupling. So one of the things to address coupling and how we can manage it is really looking at that entire system as a whole and asking yourself, what does it actually do? I love this from Office Space, I use this all the time. It's what do you say you do here? Really, what is your system in its entirety, what is it doing? It's not really just the sum of everything. It's that each individual part has a very specific responsibility within your system. So think about your own system for a, se a second. Think about how large it is, but what's really, what does it do? Because not all the parts related to it are created equally. So as an example, let's say I was talking about a distribution system. Really again, there's multiple pieces to this puzzle of this large system. So if I'm talking about distribution, really I'm talking about kind of what is at the heart, the core of what our system does. What, where's the value? Well, the value is likely in how we handle shipping and receiving and how we handle the actual physical goods within our warehouse and all the different capabilities of functionality related to that, because that's what distribution is. We're receiving product from vendors and manufacturers, and then we're selling those to consumers or other businesses. That's at the heart of what we're doing. Now, there's other pieces to the puzzle to this large system that are generally more in a supporting role. It's not to say that they're not important. They are. They just, I would say, are more in a supporting role that they're really helping at the core of really what the value is of our system brings. So this may be something like how we manage our vendors, their kind of contact information, that type of thing about the manufacturers, the venues of where we're purchasing products from. We may have other parts of our system like say how we deal with purchase orders from those vendors. Maybe that's not something we build, it's something we integrate into. Same thing with maybe we're thinking about CRM and our customers. Maybe that's something that we integrate with. Maybe that's something that we've developed ourselves a part of this larger system, but it's really not at the heart of where we're focusing our concerns are. Let's say again, in this system, the real concern is thinking about shipping, receiving, and how we're managing the warehouse. So you probably already intuitively know, if you're thinking about your own system, what really is at the heart of it. Then you may be asking yourself, okay, yeah, that's great, but everything really is connected. And that's absolutely true. Everything does relate together, but the very first thing you can do is really define what a single logical boundary is, meaning what are the pieces of functionality in your system and group those together. I'll describe more in this video later on here about which one you could tackle first, but let's just say you have this large system, yes, it's highly coupled, but then take out all those pieces of functionality that relate together and segregate those just logically. Once you define this grouping of functionality and kind of segregate it, and this could be in code if you wanna move code around, but I'm not talking about deployment concerns here. I'm just thinking about here's all these pieces of functionality. The next step from there is really thinking, okay, well, yes, there's data involved. We have these capabilities, we have these pieces of functionality, they're operating and persisting state in some database. So the key thing here really is a part of your database has to be a part of that logical boundary. We gotta be thinking about all these pieces of functionality and then the data ownership behind that. The trouble that we're having oftentimes 
is that we have other pieces of functionality completely under unrelated are also being able to either access or mutate that data that one particular boundary owns. This is what we need to eliminate. We need to eliminate this so that we define our logical boundary here on the left, those piece of functionality. It's the one that owns its data. So what we want to introduce is some means, some API, so that we're not integrating at the database level, rather we're integrating from logical boundary to logical boundary via some type of contract, some type of API. That way, if we have some type of request that already exists within our system, we want to remove that direct access to the database because we don't want, for example, any other part of our system to understand our internal implementation detail of how we're persisting data. If we do that, it's going to be really hard to change if it just can reach out to our database and read it, for example, whatever our schema is, whatever our data is. So we want to introduce some type of contract that we can version, that we define, and from there, that uh, API, that group of functionality, it owns that data, it can provide that back to the rest of your system in some way, again, that is a contract that we can version, that we can manage. What you're doing is just segregating functionality, and with that, the data behind it. You're kind of creating a fence, if you will, around these pieces of functionality, or really, if you want to think of it, kind of putting it on its own little island. And when, when you do that, you're defining what the entry point is, so how others can, other parts of your system can access or request data or perform some type of action to what's on your little island. A second step to this is just continuously, a second step is just continuing what we're doing, which is thinking about coupling. And one way to do that is kind of loosely couple between our different logical boundaries. So we have our one logical boundary we've defined so far. It has an API. Typically when something would occur, we might need to make a request response, even if we're still in process, to that API to perform some type of action. A lot of times you'll notice within your system, these types of workflows, business processes can naturally be asynchronous. And when you discover this, that's when you can use something like messaging. So we can decide, okay, this particular event has occurred. We can publish that message to a message broker, whatever infrastructure we have to do this. And then we can then consume that from our new logical boundary where it can persist state or do whatever it needs to do a part of that workflow. So we can eliminate that in process, in line, direct call from our part, big part of our system to our logical boundary and kind of loosely couple with messaging. I'll have a couple links at the very end of this video that better illustrate the use cases for messaging and event-driven architecture. So hopefully you can kind of relate that to your own system. Now you may also be commenting or screaming right now saying, okay, enough, Derek, really, this isn't that easy. I agree, this is actually very difficult to do. I often say that defining logical boundaries is one of the most important things to do, yet it's very, very difficult and difficult to get right because as your understanding changes, especially if it's in a large system, you're not gonna get it right really, but it's really important to do. So where should you start? Well, one recommendation is to think about your entire system Define what those logical boundaries are. Even just at a really high level, you haven't made any code changes, but you're thinking about, okay, what piece is a small piece of functionality, a small grouping of that? It really is kind of already a little bit segregated that we can take those out so we can understand how we're gonna be making these code changes, how we can deal with the API, the data, et cetera. So really thinking about my recommendation is finding that really small supporting role, that small piece, even if it's just a, a section of it, and carve that out. And then you can go through the motion, motions and understand about how you're actually gonna go about doing this and the, in, uh, the implications involved in your system in terms of the API, the contract that you're gonna find. And then once you've defined that, how you're gonna re, uh, kind of rewrite some code, refactor some code, so you're using that API instead of maybe accessing some data directly. So start off potentially somewhere small where you can kind of really figure everything out within that more supporting role not that it's less valuable, but it's gonna have generally less complexity and you can kind of get a feel for what you're gonna do as you keep moving forward. Once you do this for the very first time, even if it's just carving off a little part of functionality, you're gonna have a lot of lessons learned through that experience. What worked, what didn't work, what was painful, and the best part about this, it's specific to your context. So you can understand moving forward what you need to do and what works. At the end of the day, what you're really acknowledging is coupling and cohesion. You're trying to manage coupling between logical boundaries and your logical boundaries are the cohesion. That's really what you're focusing on. 
cohesive sets of functionality that belong together. If you do that, it will help at the end of the day, what I was saying at the very beginning, it will make your system easier to change without introducing bugs. It's not easy, it's difficult to do, and you'll likely have questions along the way. You can ask questions on my private Discord server and chat with other software developers about software architecture and design, get access to my private Discord server. If you're interested in joining, check the links in the description. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.